Thanks, Charles, and thanks, Matthew. Uh, so my topic is uh, revealing the myths and complexities of community seed banks. And I'm afraid by the time I finish my presentation, I will, but I might reveal that I'm a very bad speaker in terms of time management. Uh, so, so today's topic is community seed banks, but I think before I talk about community seed banks, at first I would like to give some kind of global overview about seed and plant banks, particularly in the context of Sustainable Development Goal 2 and Target 2.5. Um, and then uh, I, I will discuss about how community seed banks have emerged across many countries. Um, and then finally, I will come to the case study of Nepal, where community seed banks have emerged uh, from one in 1992 to more than 100 now. And then, yeah, so I will be basically focusing my presentation around the governance of those banks and how they offer some insights and some lessons for intellectual property discourse, sustainable development goal discourse, and things like that. So basically, if we look at Sustainable Development Goal 2, then under target 2.5, all countries are required to, by 2020, to maintain the genetic diversity of seeds, cultivated plants, and their wild species, and promote the access and benefit sharing of genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge. So this is the target that talks about seed and plant banks within Sustainable Development Goal framework. And the target also identifies the role that seed and plant banks can play in maintaining genetic diversity. If we look at the global picture, then there are millions of accessions of food and forest crops which are stored in more than uh, 1,500, 1,700 mm -hmm. gene banks and 2,500 botanical gardens worldwide. For example, you can see uh, the 15 CGIAR research centers hold around 600,000 samples of plant genetic resources. Similarly, there are the Millennium Seed Bank initiatives, initiative in or partnership in England, then the Global Seed Vault in Norway, and then the Vavilov Research Institute, and many others in the United States, Japan, and many other countries, including in developing uh, developing countries. One of the one of the important aspects of these seed and plant banks across the world is that not all of these seed banks function with the same, um, function based on the same criteria, based on the same process. Like for instance, the CGIR research centers have already included their samples of plant genetic resources in the multilateral system of the plant treaty. So it means that these samples can be obtained through uh, the conclusion of the standard material transfer agreement within within that treaty. Mm. A similar but sl a slightly different model of um, standard material transfer agreement. Um, um, uh, the global seed world, on the other hand, doesn't provide any access to plant materials because it is uh, whatever samples have been stored in that global vault is stored under black box conditions. So it's it, it, it is only meant to provide safety duplicates and not to promote access and benefit sharing uh, for any of the potential user. You know? So that's, that's the global scenario. So out of, the whole, out of the, these seed and plant banks, there are some unique types of seed banks in the world, which, for example, in many of the developed countries, we know as seed savers networks. So these are managed by local farmers or gardeners. Um, you know, like in the United States, Canada, or um, or even in Australia, um, UK. Uh, similarly, in many of the developing countries, a similar structure or similar network is found, and which um, they call or they recognize as community seed banks. So these community seed banks are also referred to as community gene banks, community seed reserves, community seed well centers, seed hearts, agrobiodiversity research centers, participatory, you know, there are so many names of these, these, uh, these community seed banks. But the focus of my presentation today is about certain myths and also assumptions associated with these community seed banks in developing countries. So if you look at some of the scholarly work and then some of the global reports that uh, have um, discussed 
the governance of community seed banks or their objectives or their rational or their performance, mm -hmm. then we find that there are certain um, common findings or uh, general findings mm -hmm. and uh, certain assumptions. Uh, uh, and then that, I think, is not sufficient for us to properly understand the governance of community seed banks. We really no need to go into the details of these assumptions and these myths so that we discover how, in fact, a seed bank is formed within a community and how they are mobilized and what is their you know, um, performance or contribution to society or to uh, the management of plant genetic resources. So I'll just read these myths and assumptions. So uh, there is a presupposition that community seed banks are homogeneous entities. For example, they share common objectives, priorities, and outputs. Um, there is also presupposition that they are initiated, owned, and managed by local farmers to, co to counterbalance the growing use of new modern plant varieties. They establish farmers' ownership rights over native plants and create the means to achieve the goals of seed and food sovereignty at the local level. They promote the access and benefit sharing of plant genetic resources. And finally, they advance the linkages between national and international gene banks, including the multilateral system of the international treaty or the plant treaty. So these are some of the assumptions that we often find in the literature that deal with community seed banks. So uh, talking about the case of Nepal, I think it is really very important for us to explore what is happening in Nepal. Because in many of the uh, scholarly analysis or international reports or global reports, the case of Nepal is often presented as a successful model for community seed banks. So basically, Nepal has inspired many other countries to uh, est establish a similar structure or similar governance mechanism for community seed systems in their countries. So that is why the case of Nepal is very important. So talking about community seed banks, their main activities are to deposit and lend the seeds of a range of crops, you know, cereals, vegetables, oil seeds, and many others. Uh, and so it's more like, they, they function more like monetary bank. So local communities deposit certain seeds and in times of need, some other communities or the same communities then come to these banks to get those uh, seeds based on a loan basis. And then, like for, for instance, if you take uh, a two kg of uh, um, uh, seed this year, then you are required to, uh, after harvesting the crop, you are required to provide the double of that seed or, or, or one and a half, uh, whatever agreed between. But, but it's, it functions more like a monetary seed bank, you know, deposit and lending. So that's the thing. And then another important activity of community seed banks is to create and maintain community biodiversity registers, which you can also see in that, that, that red document. So it, it, it basically lists what native biological material or genetic material are there in local areas, uh, what are the associated traditional knowledge. So it's a kind of a detailed documentation that communities themselves develop and then um, in their own local language and then maintain. Um, and, and sometimes uh, they also create a rate, rate registers so that uh, they do a periodic review of the status of community seed banks. So what is the rate of disappearance of certain types of crops after two years or three years or something like that. So it's a very, very interesting approach that they generally take. And they also establish diversity blocks in farmers' fields. Farmers field. So diversity blocks means that uh, they, allo they, they assign some of their members who are involved in community seed banks to allocate certain pieces of land so that they can use those land for the purpose of on-farm conservation of specific uh, varieties, which are, for example, already three or ten for disappearance or something like that, you know. So it's diversity blocks. The formation of diversity blocks by community seed banks is really very important. And also to regularly cultivate and multiply seeds, you know. So they, they use these, uh, these mechanisms. And, and their activity is also to participate in participatory variety development and breeding programs. For instance, in many countries like in India, and Nepal, and even in some African countries, there is a growing um, demand for the development of participatory breeding programs where farmers are invited to come up with their local or native genetic material for breeding 
together with scientists or public uh, breeding institutes or uh, national agriculture research uh, councils of their respective countries. You know. So these types of activities are some of the main activities of these gene banks. So in the case of Nepal, the first community seed bank was established in the 1990s. Uh, and the, the, the major objectives were to prevent the erosion of local genetic resources or native genetic resources and facilitate farmer to farmer exchange of share seeds. So when the first community seed banks was established, which you can also see in that photograph, the, the first photo photograph that was like two, 2,200 meters above the sea level that that community seed bank was first established in Nepal. So, the idea was to prevent the erosion of local genetic resources because farmers were gradually in, um, inclined to use modern plant varieties that were being supplied by private seed traders or even government bodies you know, through different um, seed distribution programs. So at that time, um, USC Canada, an international agency, uh, worked with local communities to form that community seed bank in Nepal. And the idea was to uh, really focus exclusively on the maintenance or conservation of local plant genetic diversity and not to focus on any other plant genetic di resources that were derived or imported from outside. Uh, from the 1990s to until now, like there are hundreds of other community seed banks have, be have emerged in Nepal. And at the, at the moment, um, we can see that there is a complex typology of community seed banks. You know, so there is a de facto community seed banks, which basically means that in in countries like Nepal and India, um, households or communities, local communities themselves manage their own uh, seed banking system. So they store seeds, they they exchange seeds with their neighbors or their uh, other villagers. You know, so there there is always that de facto community seed bank always prevalent in these countries, but. But there are also externally supported community seed banks, like these hundreds of other community seed banks, you know, that are emerging uh, to 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 work in the area of genetic resource management uh, in that country. But what is interesting in the case of this typology of community seed bank is that not all community seed banks now focus on native plant varieties or local plant varieties. You know, there are three different types. You know. So there are native variety focused community seed banks. They only deal with the conservation of local plant genetic resources, not the imported ones or not the modern ones or new ones uh, or protected, any variety protected by new forms of intellectual property or anything like that. And there are other sets of community seed banks which focus on both native and then modern, modern variety, uh, modern, modern plant varieties. And finally, there are modern variety focused ones. They don't really deal with any of the native plant varieties. Their mission is to operate more like a local seed trader. You know, they just deal with uh, public seed entities or private seed entities to bring certain seeds, improved seeds, in the at the village level, and then multiply them and then resell them to farmers for for use. So, so they are not necessarily contributing to the conservation of native native biological uh, diversity in that country. So, so in relation to those myths and assumptions, I think by looking at the detailed case of Nepal, we can say that there are certain complexities and certain realities that we should not ignore when it comes to the question of looking at how community seed banks operate in this globalized world, in, 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 the, in the world where there is growing demand for uh, biotechnology, growing demand for the use of native plant materials for various research, breeding, and then, you know, commercial purposes. So, so my findings suggest that community seed banks are not uniform entities. So it, it, would, be a, it would not be a good approach if we uh, treat them as a homogeneous entities and, and promote them that, like, okay, uh, there are certain global reports that state that all countries now need to establish community seed banks and then, you know, uh, promote uh, pr promote um, promote them for for the benefit of local plant genetic diversity, but not necessarily they contribute to local plant genetic diversity management. In some cases, they only operate as local seed traders, 
you know, and which is um, and um, and 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 in many cases, though the name itself, like community seed bank, gives an impression that it is owned by uh, or managed by local communities. Sometimes uh, they are influenced by external agencies to such an extent that they really don't have their own governance structure to manage these gene, gene banks. You know, I, I have even uh, interviewed some of the community seed banks, which are just conserving seeds only because they, are, they have been told to or asked to conserve seeds by some external agencies. And then when I ask the National Gene Bank about the status or the, or the viability of those seeds, then the chief of the National Gene Bank told me that many of them were collected in uh, 1995 or 96 and were never after that, you know, tried on fields. And so they are of no use. They tried some of those varieties. So, you know, so there are so many complexities and realities associated with these community seed banks that I, I think we must factor into when we talk about sustainable development goals or or supporting community seed banks. And, um, and, and we cannot also force local communities to conserve native genetic diversity. It's, it's, it's the cost of maintaining local plant genetic diversity is so high, like allocating, diverse, allocating dear pieces of land for diversity blocks. It's like we're talking about a country like Nepal where uh, uh, more than 50% of farmers hold less than 0 0.5 hectares of land, you know? So, so these details are very much important when we promote any idea like that. And, and as I told before, most of these seed banks these days operate as local seed traders or as saving and credit cooperatives because the cost of maintaining biodiversity is very high for them. And finally, this is, I think, my last slide. Uh, Community seed banks are faced with a number of challenges to facilitate access and benefit sharing. For example, complications have arisen, for example, to transfer. So community seed banks are created to facilitate the transfer of plant material from community seed bank to other entities. But there are complications. Like, for example, there are issues of intellectual property, ownership, even when there comes um, any issue of transfer between from one community seed bank to another community seed bank. So similarly, there are legal issues uh, in the case of the transfer of plant material from community seed banks to, uh, na uh, to the National Gene Bank. And there are also legal issues to include plant materials in the multilateral system of the plant treaty. Finally, I think um, my last point is that I think when it comes to the question of the governance of community seed banks, we also need to explore whether community seed banks varieties are public domain varieties or exclusive common pool resources that only they can utilize and others are not you know, um, able to use or whether they are subject to individual or collective farmers' rights, which is which about which I, I really don't have much time to discuss in detail, but I think these are the issues that are closely linked with how global negotiation on intellectual property and the protection of farmers' rights are advancing in relation to um, the International Plan Treaty, in relation to the TRIPS Agreement of the WTO, in relation to WIPO, as well as in relation to um, the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, thank you so much.